Yeah. Okay, hello guys. I think the first session is for like half techie guys, and this one is for another half who are not in techie background and uh, probably focus on business side. Well, I'm going to talk to you about something like uh, evolution stuff, which is kind of a trip, like typical, but uh, this is something like another point of view to looking at the uh, blockchain technology. Well, before starting it, well, I'm going to share some questions that my friend asked me a few days ago. Well, he's not from the blockchain, tech, blockchain industry, and he came to me and asked questions like that. Uh, why does it look like that blockchain technology is kind of stuck? So I was, what? What do you think? What, what, what does it mean? And he said that it's been several years that he has heard about, you know, fancy blockchain projects, about protocols and decentralized applications, but he cannot see anything of it, any of it. You know, he can't see any, like, real use cases or any killer deaths from his point of view. He's not, I, I told you, he's not from this blockchain industry. So, okay, probably I'll introduce Vitaly or something, someone else to tell you about the user cases. And his another question is, why does it look like that blockchain, the evolution of blockchain technology is so slow compared to other IT stuff like mobile or applications? And for that question, I cannot agree with that. So, okay, why is it? So I was trying to find a solution why blockchain evolution looks so slow and we cannot see the real evolutions from outside. I was starting to ask myself some questions and the first one is like this. What do you think? Blockchain is software? So it's not tangible. It's not you know, computer, it's not plant, it's not you know, uh, motor, motorcycle or something. So, of course, it's software. It, it sounds like software. Then, how about smart country? Is it also software? Probably. Then, since I told you about the evolution of technologies, then I'm gonna I'm gonna look at. Let's look at the evolutions of traditional hardware and software. This is something like you know, the evolutions of traditional software part and hardware part. As you can see, software, the updating software is pretty easy and continuous. And, you know, it, it doesn't really take time. You can, from updating from Windows 7 to 10, you can just download it and wait for a few minutes and that's it. How about updating hardware? There, you have to replace it and there's painful breakthrough. So you have to wait. And there should be some kind of significant development. From this point of view, what do you think about the blockchain. Let's ask you the same question again. Do you think blockchain is a software? Is it really easy to update? Is it updating is continuous? What do you think? It doesn't really look like it. It sounds like blockchain is something like hardware stuff from the characteristics of evolutions. And how about the smart contract? Once you set up the smart contract, you cannot change it. You cannot you know, update it. Smart contract is fixed. That's why we believe in that. So smart contract sounds like hardware too. Then can we say blockchain is a hardware? But it's not tangible, so it needs something. How about this? Programmable internet hardware. Do you agree? You don't have to agree with it, but sounds fair. No? All right, uh, let's look at the problems of DApps and protocols, the real problems of blockchain industry. Once you set up a DApp, well, actually, Bifrost starts from you know, developing DApps, and we realize there's the problems in the DApps. And it's 2019 right now, and if you want to develop a DApp right here, and almost 60% of DApps are based on Ethereum, which was developed in 2015. And was there any hard fork in Ethereum? No, the Ethereum itself is still there. So when you use, uh, when you develop a tech on 2019, you have to stick on the technology, blockchain technology, which was developed in 2015. 
even though there are like more and more protocols coming, which is fancy, like Oasis and, and some, something else. But once you develop a dev on Ethereum, it's really hard to change. Even though there is evolutions on protocols, it's really use that evolution from the blockchain, from the dev's point of view. So we think that there should be something in between. Since we think that dev is some kind of a services to provide services to the users, and the service should not be, you know, each service should be continuous. They should not stop their services to the users for the dev, even though the protocols are changing. If they want to change their protocol to something else, then they have to stop their services and they have to replace their life changing hardware. That's the problem why it looks like that blockchain technology is kind of stuck to other people outside of the blockchain technology. So, this is, that was the trivial cases of that. But when you use Bifrost, here's what we are doing. I'm not go into the tech side, and I'm going to show the real, you know, tech use cases. Uh, we are running a, a booth in DevCon from tomorrow, so you can come to our, you can visit us, and you can probably see what's going on there. But when you use Bifrost, what we are doing is, if there is a dev, they can use protocol. Of course, they can use protocol, something new in 2019, and they can also use some protocol in 2018, and something else like this. What I mean is, Bifrost is something for the dev that they can use like more than two protocols all at once. So we are defining ourselves like, so probably, actually not, it's Bitcoin. Bifrost make devs working on, based on Ethereum as well as Cosmos, Polkadot, and something else. That's what we are doing. So we are defining ourselves as a universal adapter for time, for devs. That's our goal, and if this is possible, then probably that can work. And then probably the real normal people who are not in blockchain industry can use blockchain even though they don't know, even though they were not aware of using it, but they'll probably use decentralized applications instead of applications itself. That's our goal, and for that, we're kind of thinking about, we have to prove ourselves. So whenever I talk about this kind of idea, everybody asking me, is it durable or is it safe? You know, using two protocols all at once, there should be something, some problems, something like proof of relay and proof of, you know, uh, some other problems. And that's what my CTO is solving right now. <laughs> and actually for that, we're trying to make an example, the real use cases using Bifrost. And what we're trying to do, well, recipe is the language that we developed, and that's gonna be, you know, any kinds of language that you are programming, your dev, will be translated to the recipe. It's automatical, not automatical, it's kind of semi-automatical, but developer doesn't have to do it. We're gonna do it, we're gonna translate to the recipe, and recipe will be on by for us, and it's gonna split the smart contract of the dev and make it work on several chains. And we were kind of trying to make use cases for that. And this is what we're going to show you in DevCon. There is a Korean reverse ICO, which is named Decargo. And Decargo is a Korean uh, global logistic company backed by Kakao in Korea. And they have users, well, uh, their mother, mother company's name is Deleo. Uh, Deleo is backed by Kakao, and what they're doing is they have a global supply chain, and they are doing all the logistic things from uh, domestically and globally. And since the cargo is reverse ICO of Deleo, and they have everything, they have you know business model, users, transactions, and everything, and they want to decentralize some of their functions, and uh, they're doing reverse ICO right now. And they programmed everything with Solidity based on Ethereum, and as you know, since they have lots of transactions, they can't really use Ethereum because it's really slow and it's gonna it's gonna cost a lot. So what we provided, uh, you know, the solution that we provided to Decargo was like, okay, you cannot use just Ethereum itself. Why don't you use, you know, public Ethereum a little bit? Well, I don't want to say public and private, but 
they want to use uh, public Ethereum for the safety for their right route registration, but because they should be really safe. And they can, you know, what we suggest for them is you can use item update information. It's not that important. You know, you can update it very frequently. There's lots of transactions. How about using it as a private blockchain, private Ethereum? Until here, it sounds like blue, or it sounds like some other one. And, and also, oh um, yeah, that's working. And they have a payment system. And they want to use Clayton because they are like a cacao family. For the domestic payments, they want to use Clay for the Clayton. So we put Clayton on them. And even though Libra is not really uh, working, it, it's working. We, we saw the call, that, but they want to use Libra if it works in, on the future. So we put Libra there. So this is our technical, second technical demonstration for the public. Uh, in Osaka from tomorrow, and we're gonna we'll run the booth, and you can come to us, and you can see how it works, like all the tech stuff and all the uh, basic, you know, program stuff and all the you know, smart contract splittings. And this is how it works for the Decargo, and from that, actually, they asked me if can you uh, add like DID protocol additionally. So there's a Korean protocol which is. Metallium, and we add it, and it worked. So that means we combine five protocols. If you say that public and private ethers are different, then we are combining five protocols all at once for one debt. And that's possible. That's what we proved ourselves. And you'll see it tomorrow, from tomorrow, from our booth. So from this, this is kind of changing evolutions of protocols, and that is what we see a software side. That should con you know, provide their services continuously to the users, and still they can experience the evolutions of protocols without stopping their services. That's where Bifrost comes, and that's what Bifrost does. I'm not going to go deep into the tech because I'm not CTO. And I cannot, even though I cannot show you the codes, but you can see it probably tomorrow from my booth. Well, this is quite a quick speech. And if you have any questions, then I can progress. Who has questions? So I just want to see if I'm getting started. Is, is Bifrost, are you actually compiling and deploying the smart contracts to all the different chains it's connected to, or is it just selective uh, like state and functionality that you're deploying to each one? Like from the uh, previous example, mm -hmm. it seemed like maybe you're only deploying logic and state that's uh, related to payment to Libra, for example, mm -hmm. and for um, yeah, for IAM updates to private Ethereum. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, are you just selectively deploying parts of the, the code to each of these chains, or what? Well, actually, we are not selecting. You know, dev developer, they are the one who decide which function of them goes to you know private ether or public ether we're collecting. So we are just the provider. And uh, here's here's the deal. You know, dev developer come to our portal, and they choose protocol of their choices, and they're gonna you know let us know what kind of function should go this side and this side and. Uh, if they modulize their program, then that's going to be great because you know they can just send their modules, and what we are doing is splitting their modules, you know, from the smart contract side, smart contract point of view, and then deploy it to different like protocols and make it work. And that's actually where we have patents, and that's actually where the techs are. Gotcha. All right. Another question for Bifrost for there. I'll just yeah, okay. So what's your cooperation model slash business model uh, working with these protocols? Okay, that's a good one. Well, actually, if, well, for this example, Decargo, uh, before Bifrost, they have to pay for the gas fee of Ethereum. And using Bifrost, the gas fee will be lowered. A l well, it's going to be lowered a lot because they are using lots of private blockchain. And we're going to add some fees on that. 
that's our business model. So it's it's like a subscription model. If they use Bifrost, and if there's more and more transactions, then probably by the transaction we're gonna get, uh, we're gonna you know uh, charge them some fees on that. So this is really exciting and it's really great to see people, obviously interoperability is a huge challenge for the industry and stuff. One question I had is, um, another challenge is um, end users having to pay gas fees. Um, it, with Bifrost, does that help in any way? I see you working across different protocols. How's the end user experience like? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you mean the user experience from of using dApps or like for the dApp users? Yeah, like uh, they still actually have to pay gas in, say, Ether or on Libra. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's why there's a, a so-called BFC, Bifrost coin. So all you have to since they're using like all protocols all at once, they have to prepare lots of you know uh, coins. But you know by using BFC, they can all they have to do is take some buy BFC over there, and they don't have to care about all the fees. We're gonna take care of the fees and. We're gonna reduce the fees, and if there's a margin call, then we're gonna you know, ask them to uh, like add more BFC on that. So, so effectively, your partners are basically subscribing with you, and then you're handling the gas fees down to lower level protocol. So that's right. Beautiful. Thanks. Next question. I think that's it. Let's give Bifrost a warm round of applause. Okay. Right, thank you.